أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على شرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله So last uh, in the last episode uh, we just looked at the introduction of the uh, series and, and in general just a short definition of what eschatology is but i really want to approach this more as a science than a general uh, lecture or or just uh, talking on the subject in general and so what i want to look at today inshallah is the 10 principles what are known as uh, the they are known as mabadi ashra lil ulum 10 principles in the sciences of our tradition and uh, you can find these 10 principles there's an interesting versification that was done by uh, Muhammad uh, Ibn Ali As-Saban and he put it into a versified form in the Mabadiya kullu fannin ashra al haddu wal mawdu thumma al thamra wa fadluhu wa nisbatu wal wadi wal ismu al istimdadu hukmu al shari مسائل والبعد بالبعد اكتفى ومن درى الجميع نال الشرفة. There are ten principles to every fun and this is what in our tradition the sciences were really regarded as art forms. A fun is an is an art form or an art. So sciences were regarded as arts. So I want to look at all these ten principles as they pertain the science of eschatology. Now. The first of this is al-had. Al-had is really a boundary. It's the limitation. So that's what that's what a definition is. And that's what this first principle is. What's the definition of the science? And the definition is what gives you its entire parameters. When you define something, you define everything that concerns or you condense everything that concerns it into a singular understanding. A one sentence or two sentence or however long that definition is going to be defines all the parameters and boundaries about that thing. So what is the definition of eschatology now? And I'm going to look at this more also in the episode after the next. I'll expand more on the definition and these principles. But in short, I would like to look at a couple of definitions that I found from other sources which I consider to be very weak definitions and these are islamic sources so i'm not even looking at the definitions that are provided from because eschatology is also studied in christianity and is also studied in judaism hinduism also has an eschatology of its own they all have their own eschatologies like i said these are religions that were at one time true religions and they received their messengers and prophets who brought the same theme the same essential creed and so eschatology was already part of their tradition. So one definition I found says that Islamic eschatology is a field of study in Islam concerning future events that would happen in the end times. Now, there's a couple of issues I find with this definition. One is the idea that con- that it concerns future events because Future is a relative term. For somebody living in the 11th century, for them, the 12th century was the future. For someone living in the 14th century, for them, the 20th century is the future. For us living today, 100 years from now is the future. So which event would we particularly be looking at or examining? The problem with this definition is that it delineates everything that would be happening in the present or has happened in the past to the present and in the near future that we can anticipate. It removes all that from the field of study and only examines particular events that would be occurring at the very climax of the finality which in this regard are classified as the major signs. And so they, f- they focus their entire attention on the signs themselves, but do not give any due attention to the events that would be leading up to those signs. And that's something we'll talk about in another session as well, inshallah. The other thing that is wrong with this definition is the fact that they say that these future events would happen in the end times. And so... Bringing in a component of time is always an issue. When would these end times occur? When would you anticipate them to happen? And why would you classify these future events to not be happening, let's say, right now or tomorrow? 
in which you create this sort of perception that, you know, it's not going to happen for another thousand years, so there's no need to worry about it. That's one extreme of it. The other extreme is all this has already been worked out by previous scholars, so there's nothing more for us to add on to investigate. They've already outlined all the events. They've already outlined all the the tafsirs, and they've already looked at all the hadith, and everything's been worked out. So there's no more investigation that we need to do. We just need to focus on being good Muslims and let that be and let it happen when it happens. And that's a very wrong approach to take by anyone who has enough sense to understand what's happening around the world needs an explanation that cannot be justified by such a definition. The, the other definition I found was that Islamic eschatology is the branch of Islamic scholarship that studies Yawm al And now this is correct to a certain degree, but not as a definition for the science of Islamic eschatology. Because Islamic eschatology does not study Yawm al the eschatology, there's not much to study insofar as Yawm al-Qiyamah is concerned. Everything that is outlined insofar as Yawm al-Qiyamah is concerned is something that exists beyond our rational perspective and cannot be studied in, in a scientific way. Because science, and we'll look at this in the next session, inshallah, science requires a, a methodical approach in which some data can be compiled, theories can be formulated, and hypotheses can be tested. And so to say that we are going to study Yawm al qiyamah is simply, I mean, it's an oxymoron to, to even suggest that because those events are beyond our rational understanding because what happens in the Akhirah is not subject to the same rules and laws of time and space as we are related to now. And everything that we compile in our sciences is related to time and space. And what sort of time and what sort of space we'll be looking at at that time or experiencing in that age is, is beyond our comprehension right now. All we have are certain indicators from the Quran, from the Hadith that give us an, an, an idea of what to expect. And that's so far as the, science, as the study of that goes. And that's really the issue with this definition. Now, I would give the definition that that Islamic eschatology is a branch of the sciences of Islam that studies the period between the revelation of the Qur'an and the final hour. That, I think, would be a more appropriate definition for this science. The period of time, which is the age of the, the final age of human civilization in this world and this worldly existence, which begins from the revelation of the Qur'an or at the point when the Prophet ﷺ received his nubuwa until the trumpet is blown. And this goes back to the hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said that between my coming and the hour, and he held up two fingers close to each other. And he said, Kahatain. It's like these two fingers. So this is essentially it. He is the last messenger the Qur'an is the last testament, he is the seal, and so this is the finality now. We are, we are literally in the final age, and all we are waiting for at this point is the final hour. So this is the last day, if you want to look at it, in a cosmological time scale, not in a 24-hour cycle, and we'll talk about time and dimensionality in a future session as well, where you've got these ages that humankind has gone through, major ages so you've got one age between the between adam alayhi salam and then nuh alayhi salam that's one whole age and then a, a, a transformation took place at that point with the flood then you had another age from nuh alayhi salam to ibrahim alayhi salam and then at ibrahim's time another transformation a major transformation took place then you've got now another age from Ibrahim alayhi salam up until Dawood alayhi salam. So another transformation took place. Then you've got another trans an age from Sulaiman alayhi salam or Dawood at the same time up until Nabi Isa alayhi salam. That's another age. 
and then from Isa alayhi salam to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that's another age and then from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam to the final hour and that's the final age or the final epoch and the Hindu tradition has something of the sort which they call Kalki Avatar which is sort of the last avatar and avatar or avatar is also is the same in terms of its meaning going going deep into the Sanskrit definition of avatar is essentially a prophet so the last prophet Kalki Avatar the last prophet although they have a different understanding of what a prophet really is and they look at it more in terms of their of a reincarnation of the same spirit the a reincarnation of the same prophetic spirit they have their own way of examining it but in concept if you remove all that if you look at it in concept it's really regarding the last messenger the last prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so that's really the definition that i would give islamic eschatology as the branch of the sciences of islam not as a branch of islamic scholarship or as a field of study no as a science of islam that studies the period between the revelation of the quran and the final hour because one thing that the quran did was to dramatically change the world the world as a whole not just the arabs uh, the whole world was transformed during that 23 year period because the quran came in at a time when the arabic language was really at its peak at its at its maximum potential it had reached its height of eloquence and articulation and vocabulary of words though it was not primarily a written language even in its oral transmission it was pristine and the quran came in and lifted it a notch higher there were many words many terms many concepts that the quran has tra- had dramatically transformed in civilization and that transition it spread out from the arabs it went into other civilizations as well i'll give you one example in surah al-hujurat allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ya ayyuhan nas and he addresses all of mankind in this ya ayyuhan nas inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha indeed we have created you from male and female and so among mankind he's also addressing male and female the men and the women waj'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila and we placed you in in groups of in peoples and in tribes lita'arafu that you may know one another and so if you look here it doesn't matter whether you're from whichever tribe whichever background whichever ethnicity whichever nation uh you know race uh whichever part of the world you're from whether you're male or you're female all of mankind each and every person included whether it's believer non-believer kafir whichever it might be you have been put into these denominations so that you can know one another lita'arafu so this is a tafa'al it's not he didn't say lita'arafu so that you can know he said lita'arafu so that you can know each other you can come to understand from each other because each denomination has something to bring to the collective of human knowledge but then he says inna akramakum 'inda Allah atqakum inna Allah 'alimun khabir indeed the most noble amongst you the most noble of you with allah are those who have who have taqwa or atqaqum those who are righteous now in in those times going to the to the jahili arabs and part of the world culture now it was also prevalent among the europeans among the greeks and the jews as well among the romans one of the things that associated nobility was wealth and riches now in the arab tradition a person was considered was considered generous and noble when when if they had a guest they would treat them with utmost and highest respect and give them the most exquisite of foods and accommodation and all that and one of the things that they used to give was grapes and grapes were considered a luxury food a luxury fruit from what also 
they they would make wine of right even even now the you know wine is considered something of a high value uh in these cultures and and one of the words for so akrama or or karima comes from karmun also which is uh which is which is grapes so the the culture had associated nobility with this sort of wealth and riches and the generosity of it and how you how you how you show it to you know when you when you have guests and you welcome them and how you demonstrate this generosity to them and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends this ayah and says it doesn't matter which which group you're from whether you're man or a woman it doesn't matter what what you can what you think you know about nobility and generosity or what your culture what your ethnicity what your background has given you in terms of this tradition that you've been following if you want true nobility true generosity with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is righteousness you see so the very concept of nobility in society was changed by the Quran and this is something that eventually also was transmitted from the arabs and went on to other cultures and other civilizations as well now on the second piece now so that was alhad the definition of the science of eschatology and, and and i know i spent a lot more time on the definition because getting that right is really of the most uh, of the highest importance because it then i helps you identify all the other uh, principles of the science so the second piece is the mawdu' which is the subject and so the subject matter of eschatology really is the investigation of signs indicative portents that have been prophesied then in addition to events that are transpiring in the human world and in human affairs and to identify how these events or what sort of trend they are building up to and are they contributing factors leading to those signs and we'll talk about more about signs and indicatives and portents and and the, and the idea that the signs are not solitary events they have got micro events or other events that lead up to them and so part of eschatology is identifying this chain of events that lead up to those signs so that you can you can essentially anticipate that a certain trend is contributing to a certain sign manifesting and then you've got the thamar which is the fruit the thamara uh, or or the benefit which is the fruit of the tree the the fruit of the tree is the benefit of having the tree and so the benefit of the science is that i would say provides one with a clear a clearer understanding of the present to future unfoldings so that you can identify the present course and then navigate a path through the trials and tribulations if you've identified that you're living in a world where by a lot of things that are happening that you can almost connect to those hadith that you studied when you were in madrasa or you heard when you were you know at a lecture at a masjid or something and you're almost able to connect the two together and so it almost feels like could this really be the end game that we're living in could this really be because along with that we have all this fitna that is taking place which is part and parcel of the eschatological age the finality the fitna is a prevalent indicator and so what do we do then is the is is really the question once you identify what it is now what do you do with it that's really the question well you can't actually resolve it because if you try to resolve the fitna you are essentially trying to nullify the prophecy and so you kind of fall into a paradox you can't stop it from happening you cannot defeat the the characters and the players which we will be looking at as well who are the chief characters and players of the of the final signs you can't defeat them you cannot you cannot delude them you cannot ha- because it has been prophesied to occur you can't change that so what do you do in this case the idea behind studying them is for you to find a path which you can navigate around all these conundrums you can make sense of because one of the things that really puts a human being in a state of distress is not knowing or understanding the problem that they're encountering once you understand the problem i e you understand the fitna you identify it it makes it a lot more easier for you 
to now decide and to figure out what you need to do. And so that's really the, the thumber of, of this uh, science. And this is also related to the next piece, which is the fadl, the, the merit. What is the merit of this science? And so, you know, it's, it, would, it saves people, if they study it and they understand, it saves them from, number one, misinterpretations of the occurrences and being snared into the deceptions. Because if you don't know how to identify the deception, then the likelihood of you being entrapped by the dece deception is very high. It also saves you from heedlessness and ignorance when it comes to what your Prophet has been instructed to reveal to you because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen to reveal to us these signs. They're not there for our entertainment. They were not given to us for entertainment, for us to feel good about it. They were given to us so that we can understand them. Because when you understand a sign, you understand that a sign does not point to itself. It always points to something else. We'll talk about this in a, another session as well. It always points to something else. So the, the impetus is on us to find out what does the sign signify so as to save yourself from heedlessness and ignorance. That's really the merit of mastering the science. And, and the same goes for any other science. The merit of mastering a science is to understand what that science entails to save you from the heedlessness and ignorance of it. And then comes the nisbah, which is the relationship of that science to other sciences and other disciplines. Now, this is a tricky one because eschatology is a very broad science and it requires requisite knowledges from many other sciences which themselves are major sciences. And so it is related to nearly every other science. But what it does is it chiefly provides a wider spectrum and framework of application to all those other sciences. So it is directly entwined with every other science, whether you want to choose your fiqh or your hadith or your tafsir, or even so far as what would now be material sciences like medicine and physics and chemistries and all these other sciences. If you want to look at these, eschatology really gives you a framework with which, within which to also examine these other sciences. And then you've got al wadi which is the founder of the science. Now, many of the sciences that were developed in our tradition and going back in human history can be traced back to somebody who originally founded the science or who established at least uh, the roots of the science. But eschatology does not really have a particular founder to the science per se, since, as we said, it is a science that has always been studied by humankind it has always been a part of every other culture and the science itself is directly and wholesomely derived from the scriptures, right? It is one of the seven themes of the Quran. So it is directly drawn from the Quran. But if I was to give, if I was to acknowledge someone in our tradition whom I would consider as a founder of the science of eschatology, I would probably name Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman radiallahu anhu because he essentially used to study it the most. And it's very interesting because he said, and you'll find the hadith in Kitab al-Fitn actually of Imam al-Bukhari's uh, selection. He says, كَانَ النَّاسُ يَسْأَلُونَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَمُ عَنِ الْخَيْرِ That other people used to ask the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم about good, about khair. وَكُنْتُ أَسْأَلُهُ عَنِ الشَّرِ But I used to ask, about evil, مخافتة أن يدركني, because I was afraid that it would overtake me. And so, like, remember I said the carrot and the stick, it's either reward or punishment, which would motivate an individual. So he was, he was motivated by the stick in this case. He was afraid that if he did not understand evil, it would consume him and he wouldn't even be aware of it. So he used to ask a lot of questions to the Prophet Wasallam regarding uh, evil. And part of his questioning was that he used to also ask regarding things like fitna, things like the signs, and really try to understand them. So, I mean, this was a science that was already being studied long before many of the other sciences were established in our tradition. And it was being studied by the Sahaba 
in the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is one of the things that really gives the science a high import. And then we have Al-Ism, which is the name of the science. Now I'm going to skip this for a moment and we'll look at this in a future episode when I'm going to expand on it in a lot more detail to really go back, go into what the science is called in our tradition. Uh, we have the English term eschatology, but what is it in, is in, in the Islamic sciences? And then we have al-istimdad, which are the sources. Every science has a source from where it is derived from. Any science that is just made up out of the thin air is not considered a science at all. And in, in, in contemporary academics, it would be considered a, a pseudoscience. And what's interesting about contemporary sciences is that they actually acknowledge, even the secularists acknowledge uh, eschatology to be a valid science, even though they don't believe in it. Because one of the things that eschatology does is its primary source is the scriptures in every religion. And every religion, when you look, examine their theologies, they differ. They differ on the name of God. They differ on who their prophets are. They differ on what the message is. They differ on how they should worship or what the elements of worship are. They differ on all these things, but they all agree on this one thing, which is the finality of humankind and the return to God Almighty for judgment and heaven and hell. They all agree on that. Though they differ on everything else, they all agree on this. And so it's a very difficult thing for secularists to sort of dismiss it altogether unless they can come up with definitive proof which they have been constantly trying against the Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament, against the Vedas, against all these other scriptures, including the Quran, to try and discredit their authority and their authenticity. And they've always been having a very tough battle against that. So unless they're able to fully do that without a shadow of doubt, they will not be able to disprove the science. They will have, they have to acknowledge eschatology. And even as far as the secular sciences go, and eschatology is still part of secular sciences as well. Because like I said, it's in our fitra. So if you look at physics, for example, there are theories that have been validated and been proven insofar as the destruction of the universe is concerned, the finality of the universe. They may not be able to quantify the finality of humankind insofar as a return to a divine entity is concerned, but they can quantify the destruction of the universe, the disintegration of everything, which is something that the Quran constantly reminds us of if especially if you look at the last few surahs in in the last Jews of the Musaf uh, so that's that's the, the sources are from the holy quran now there is an epistemology behind this which is also something we're going to look at later on inshallah to examine now what these sources are and how they are ranked and how they are put together in terms of the proper epistemology so we'll look at this inshallah in a later episode and then we have the hukm sharia which are the legal rulings. Now, the legal ruling of eschatology is that it is both a fard ayn and a fard kifaya, in my evaluation. It is a fard ayn because it is part of aqidah and its comprehensives and its essentials must be understood and must be believed in where it has been definitively proven Things like the coming of the Dajjal or the coming of Nabi Isa, the 10 major signs, the blowing of the trumpet, and many of the events that would occur within the, the two trumpets, the, the hour itself. So those are part of Aqidah and they have to be studied and they have to be known in its comprehension and essential. So that's a Fard Ayn in that category. Now it is a Fard Kifaya in its extensions and its branches. So it is not vitally important for every individual to have to study eschatology in its complete sense, but it is vital for every individual to have, at the very least, a working knowledge of eschatology. Because going back to that other point where we say that it provides you with a framework for other sciences and other applications. And I'm going to talk about this in more detail, inshallah, in future episodes by giving real-time examples, especially of the last few years and some of the major events that have taken place and why many scholars made monumental blunders when it came to these events because they were examining these events and applying judgment using the basic sciences such as the fiqh or the aqidah and such and such, but 
not applying it within an eschatological framework, which is what caused them to make such blunders. So we'll talk about this in another session, inshallah. And now we have the final 10th uh, piece, which is the which are the masail. And these are the topics, the issues, the matters, all the things that are discussed in the subject. Now, because it's a broad subject, a broad science, uh, I'm not going to go through all the different topics and subject matters. But in a nutshell, the science itself involves the interpretation of prophecies. And one of its key issues is the interpretation of prophecies in real time and deciphering them to either explain an event that is presently occurring or an event that is anticipated. And this is one of the major issues. It is, is that as a science, it is largely an interpretive science. And it's dealing with a lot of metaphysical components, things that are not yet seen or have not yet been manifested. In a future session, we're gonna, I'm going to talk about physics and metaphysics. You'll understand exactly what I mean by metaphysics or metaphysical. But some of the topics included are the study of the signs of the hour. And this is an important piece because I've seen a lot of people talk about signs of the day of judgment, signs of Qiyamah, like one of those definitions that we looked at earlier, so, uh, the study of Yawmul Qiyamah. It's not really about that. The more accurate topic is the signs of the hour, both major and minor signs. And then there are also portents, there are indicatives, there are other technical terms that fall under that category. Another topic of discussion in the science is the evaluation of human affairs, politics, military movements or motions, human affairs and the physical and metaphysical implications and their manifestations, the things that we do and how these are contributing to that finality taking place because everything that is pertaining that finality regards us and the positions we take. And when we examine now human history, you find all these pivotal events that take place in human history that determine the course of human history, that determine now which peoples are going to suffer the grunt of it or the brunt of it, and which peoples might be saved, and what events they put in place. Because a lot of the works that are in place right now, even at the moment in this present uh, age of ours, the, uh, a lot of these events are in place to set the stage for that finality to take place. And this is something we'll discuss as we go along in this series. Another topic is historical analysis. So history plays a key role and interpretation of history also. We are in a, such a period of time where we are about 1400 years off from the first marker, which was the revelation of the Quran. And eschatology pertains the study of this period between the Quran and the hour. So we are much closer to the hour than the last 1400 years of people. And the events that have taken place in the last 1400 years have been shaping up to the events that are taking place right now. So a historical analysis is part and parcel of this study. But it's not just about knowing the historical facts. It's also about knowing how to interpret them how to analyze them, and then how to read between the lines. That's really the most crucial piece here, and it's the piece that very few individuals are able to do. So those were the 10 principles of the science of eschatology, and I've really condensed it all into this small session of ours. Inshallah, I want to write a book, and I'm currently in the process of writing one, so I will definitely include this entire section as a chapter on its own to go into the, to the finer details of each of these principles and how they pertain to eschatology. And that is all the time we have for today. Subhanaka wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samiyun alim wa tuba alayna ya maulana innaka anta tawabur rahim. Birahmatika ya rahman rahimin. Barakallahu fikum wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakumullahu khairan. Alhamdulillah.